Okay, sorry for the romantic question, but what do you use the most beautiful idea in astronomy, in stellar astronomy? Well, so early on, you know, when, when I was in high school, I, I was thinking like, okay, well, what, what, what do I want to do when, I'm grow, when I grow up, right? <laughs> I knew I wanted to do astronomy, but I was a little bit torn because my interests were definitely stars, stellar astronomy, but also chemistry. I always had a fascination about the elements, so Marie Curie was was a, a, a big role model. Um, my friend actually made a, a beautiful, produced a beautiful movie about the discovery of um, of, of, of the elements. This is a theater uh, play, uh, but digitized, uh, uh, where when I saw it, I could actually kind of relive the sort of discovery moment that, that Marie Curie had. It, it sent shivers down my spine. It, it was fantastic. I mean, this is this is the kind of thing that that I wanted to experience. Um, but yeah, so nuclear physics and element creation and formation was really interesting to me. Chemistry, the elements, stars, and all of that. And I was like, I don't know if I ever find something that combines all of these things. <laughs> and then I yeah. ended up in Australia and I, I met this, this person and he was working on old stars. And as I was sitting in his talk, hearing about this for the first time, it kind of, it clicked all over my head. And it's like, oh my God, it, it all fell in place because we can use these old stars to study the elements, to learn how they're formed. We can get these clean signatures that help us inform the nucleosynthesis processes, you know, and I know, of course, I need to know a lot about stars too. So it's it's like all together. And it, that that was sort of a moment of magic. Mm-hmm. And then the fact that, I have now done that for 20 years. It's, it's just like I won the lottery. <laughs> it all clicked into place. And so in some sense, it's an, it's an ongoing love story for me, if I could say it like that, where, you know, I found my stars, <laughs> my <laughs> thing, and I am fortunate enough to be able to keep doing that. And I'm happy to see where, where it will take me. You know, it's an evolution as with every relationship, mm-hmm. you have to, if you don't march forward, you move backwards. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not interested in moving backwards. So I'm, I'm letting the field and the discoveries and the findings lead me to, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm often, um, I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's not hard for me to follow sort of my hunches. And sometimes even at the telescope, it's like, mm, let's take a look at this one. I have a good feeling. And then usually something good or you know not bad <laughs> pops <laughs> pops out at the end yeah. and i um i really like that a that i have the freedom to to do that that i'm allowed to follow my hunches um too many people i think are sort of boxed in with their job or their life that they they don't have that kind of freedom that that's really important to me and i certainly try to make use of that i also try to teach that to others to trust them to learn you know you need to learn your things but then you need to also trust that knowledge and that you have a grasp on it right you get out what you put in and um being able to contribute in meaningful ways to our knowledge about our cosmic ancestry our cosmic history um that that's that's a wonderful thing <laughs> and in this way your personal love story with the stars evolves what advice, you've already spoken to it a little bit, but what advice would you give to young people that are trying to find the same kind of love story in their career, in their life? It seems increasingly hard for folks to to find that. Um, sometimes I feel um, that, you know, young people uh, have all the opportunities these days, and that's that's wonderful, but it's almost like that leads to some... What's the right word? They're they're a little bit of tired of too too tired to make all the decisions mm-hmm. because at some point you need to put your eggs in a basket mm-hmm. and you need to be okay with that. Mm-hmm. You, we can't do all the things, even though we're often told you can be president too. And I think that's really important to convey. But at the end of the day, we can only have sort of one job or one type of profession. I'm not saying you know you need to be locked in, but um, it's hard to change 180 degrees. And and so lots of people I think are often afraid to to really dig in at least for some time and get their hands real dirty 
and really learn from the bottom up. On one thing. On one thing, because they're afraid they're missing out on, on 99 other things. Mm -hmm. But life is a little bit missing out on 99 other things because we only have 24 hours in a day. I... I have that feeling very often. There are so many things I would like to do, many things I would like to try to be good at. Sometimes I wish I had a different job, you know, mm -hmm. because I have other interests too, but I realized, okay, I can only do one thing. Um, so I have no regrets. Um, but this is this is a general feeling that I think, I, I would think most of us have. But if it lets, if it stops you from really digging, drilling down on one thing to become an expert in one thing, to become really good at one thing that you call your own, mm -hmm. then that it just makes it difficult. And so a fulfilling life uh, is in part likely to be discovered in a singular pursuit of a thing, of one thing. Well, yeah. Or for at least for a time. Yeah, for some time with your, with your heart and your hands. Mm -hmm. Um, because I think most people long to own something. You know, we all, I think, want to leave some legacy of some sorts, you know, for our children, for humanity, for this planet. <laughs> and I think it's really important for young people to strive for that and not lose sight or trade that for all the opportunities because an opportunity is nothing if you don't do anything. Mm -hmm. You need to... You need to do something at the end of the day. So I chat with lots of people about this. And I often start by just saying, hey, tell me what you don't like. <laughs> Because it's often much easier yeah. to, to you narrow know. Down, narrow uh, down, narrow down, narrow <laughs> down. Let out what, what's not on your plate. Yeah. And then this way we get a little bit closer. And then it's like, well, why don't you take a risk yeah. and just sign up for something for three months? But that's what you it can feels like. That. It, that's what it feels like. And it is that, is a risk. Commitment is a risk. Yes. Because it's you're basically sacrificing all the other possible options. But then I guess you have to trust the magic you, you noticed in that thing. Yes. If you notice one thing, just stick with it. And then and then maybe there's something there. Right, right. And and this moment of kind of feeling it in, in your entire body and mind that this is the right thing, you know, getting there is is probably really hard. Mm -hmm. But if you don't try, you won't find out. Right. The hard stuff is the fun stuff. That's also another thing you find <laughs> yes. out. And then there is that, yes. <laughs> Somehow, it doesn't make sense. Uh, you also mentioned that uh, you've have taken a little stroll into the artistic representation of yourself. Uh, can, you, can you speak to that for a little bit? <laughs> yes. Well, I already just mentioned, uh, sometimes I wish I, I, you know, had more time to do other things. So I find little, little... Um, sideways i guess to to pursue things that that i like besides astronomy or at least i try to find connections and so um some years ago i um again with the help of of uh, my friend who made this marie curie movie uh she and i wrote a one woman play where i actually portray lisa meitner mm -hmm. who was an austrian german physicist nuclear physicist i'm from germany so I have the right accent for that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and we wrote this play about this moment of discovery of nuclear fission. Again, this is an absolutely critical piece that explains my work today. And we all stand on the shoulder of giants. She was one of those giants. And in some ways, it's, it's of course, a way for me to acknowledge other people's work that have come before me. It's a wonderful way to highlight um, the contribution by a prominent woman. And the way I I do it is, uh, it's a 25-minute play uh, in costume mm -hmm. where I relive for people the moment of discovery. Mm -hmm. Then I turn into myself and then I give a 30-minute presentation on the art process and the creation of heavy elements mm -hmm. because the audience can now perfectly understand that, the public audience, given the historic backdrop of this discovery that they just lived through my presentation. And it's it's a wonderful compliment that almost spends 100 years from one woman to the next, passing on the torch. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, when we write up our results in, let's say, you know, in magazines like Nature and Science, it's always about the result on the golden platter, perfectly prepared. It's the discovery is never described, only ever the results. You asked me uh, beforehand, right? What does it feel to be at the telescope in this moment, right? Mm -hmm. I'm happy to talk about this, but it's nowhere written ever. Mm -hmm. nobody, nobody really talks about it. And so having a form of, uh, you know, theater of the arts to bring this, this exciting moment that, that is what we all want to experience as scientists to a wider audience is so profound and so rewarding And they all love it because everyone can understand a moment of discovery. I was looking for something and then I found it. It's like you misplaced car keys, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Or love. It, yes, yes. It, it, everyone can <laughs> understand What the glorious it. experiences, yes. The, the implications and the findings, that is much harder to understand yes. for, the, for anyone. This is where the scientists work truly lies this is our job but the moment of discovery is easy and it's beautiful yeah. and it needs to be said and so taking my audience on this journey what is the perils what are my worries and then ah oh, here is the moment of discovery let me tell you about it 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 profoundly transformed me and here here's how it went right it it it's so good and art is a way to reveal this fundamentally human side of science yes it's the problem with science is that's people doing it <laughs> that's also Maybe not the, a problem but that's that that's is also it. what makes it beautiful right yeah. i mean humans are fascinating and that we're able to come up with these ideas through all the struggle through all the hardship through all yes, the hope yes, yes. through all the search and so find. the art's a great way to to portray that and to broadcast that, right? I think this is how the audience really should be interacting with scientists, much less about the findings, but really more about this yearning for answers, right? I need to find these khakis. I need, I need it because I need to go, right? It's like now, now. <laughs> and then, oh God, here it is. Now I can go my, my merry ways. <laughs> it's, it's so relatable. Yeah. We just need to find more and better ways to, to do that. So I hope to turn this into also a digitized version at some point to, again, make it more accessible. Mm -hmm. I um, hope so, too. I'd so far, to I'm it. just doing it in person. <laughs> But it's, it's I would, really I would nice. love it. And I think uh, a lot of people would love to see it. So I hope you do just that. Let me ask you a big, ridiculous question. You look up at the stars. You look up at the early, early, early stars. So let me ask the big question that we humans often ask and struggle to answer. What's the meaning of this whole thing? Why, why are we here? We talked about, you know, the biological evolution requires the chemical evolution for all of this to kind of play out. And carbon played this important role. And, you know, in some sense, we're, we're just a, a consequence of all of these things being the way they are, right? So maybe this is just where we are supposed to be because, you know, the, the laws of physics sort of work the way they do. And um, we talked much about the variety of, of everything, really, in certainly, you know, from over here to over there and things in the vicinity of where the sun and the solar system formed, they were the way they were. And life maybe was a necessary consequence of that. So, I, in some sense, I like to believe that because then it becomes reproducible and we can apply that same argument elsewhere. <laughs> <laughs> If it's total chance, right, that makes it harder. And that's not, not truly satisfying to, to a scientist. So it's a, it's a consequence of psychological evolution, which is a consequence of biological evolution, which is a consequence of chemical evolution, consequence of physical evolution, whatever, whatever disciplines. It's uh, turtles on top of turtles. Turtles all the way down, yes. <laughs> I yeah. And you I mean, have studied some of the most ancient turtles. Yes, at yes. the very bottom of the thing. <laughs> <laughs> That's, right. That's right. They live for quite a while. Yeah, they do. <laughs> well, uh, thank you for your incredible work. Thank you for uh, highlighting both the human side and and the deep scientific side. It's just I'm I'm a huge fan of your work, and thank you for everything you do. And thank you for talking today. This is awesome. Of course, it was wonderful. Thank you.